Trump is a new kind of conservative, but he is a conservative. We have David Faber here with us uh, today. He was a professor of, for history at the University of Kansas in Lawrence. Uh, he's an expert on contemporary American history and has written numerous books. But today he's here to talk with us about American conservatism. Thanks for coming to Göttingen, Mr. Faber. Good to be here. It seems like American conservatism means something different than what Europeans usually understand mm -hmm. when they hear the word conservatism. What's peculiar about it? What's special about American conservatism? I think Ironically, the two kinds of conservatism might finally be converging, but only with the advent of Donald Trump. Before then, I think they were different. The American version of conservatism was much more aimed at economic elites, was opposed to big government interventions, was not particularly nativist, and was not really oriented toward trying to appeal to, let's say, the common person in the United States. Though the politics of that question, to whom does conservative conservatism appeal, has been a complicated one. So when did the movement come together historically? What's the point of departure? From what time on can we speak of the conservative movement in the United States? Again, a contentious question. I think, from my perspective, American conservatism really only began with the opposition to the New Deal. The New Deal was the politics of Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s. And it's at that point that economic elites in particular began to articulate a kind of conservative vision for the United States. It went through many iterations after that time, and I think we can't see a straight line on conservatism, but zigs and zags. So it's a very contentious history, actually. That's right. Um, and also, this is a political movement that consists of very disparate ideological elements. It seems very, very heterogeneous. So how did the leaders of the movement, or the leaders of the Republican Party for that matter, how did they manage to keep those elements together? I think that was always the trick. The United States is a two-party system. As a result, both parties have traditionally been heterogeneous. They're made up of many different components. The Republican Party and the conservative movement were not always synonymous. It's really only since the 1980s that conservatism took over the Republican Party. And it did so by adding constituencies. That's what any good political party must do. It has to aggregate different kinds of people to create, in the United States' case, a majority. So what began as a conservative elite interested in economic policy, over time became a coalition of social conservatives, muscular nationalists, uh, religiously oriented people, as well as those economic elites. So each constituency brought with it voters, enough voters finally put the first conservative president, Ronald Reagan, into office in November 1980. But what kept them together to come back to that question maybe? I mean, these are very heterogeneous elements. Why do free market enthusiasts join forces with American evangelicals? That's the hardest question, isn't it? And right now, in 2016, we're trying to see if that coalition will stand up. It was a kind of complicated, what's the right word, manipulation in part? So conservative elites, again primarily economic elites, knew that they needed more voters. In the 1950s, and it goes back that half century or more, there was a realization that anti-communism was a tool by which you could converge different groups around the same basic ideology. Now, most middle class and working class anti-communists didn't really care about high economic policy, but they did care about the atheistic component of communism. So many religious people suddenly saw themselves as fellow travelers with conservative elites, as both of them opposed communism, albeit not for the exact same reason. So it's a common enemy. A common enemy created a kind of coalition. Still wasn't enough to win elections. It would take additional coalition partners to do that. And we can keep thinking about how conservative elites kept trying to find those new constituencies. In your book, The Rise and Fall of Modern American Conservatism, you, you choose a kind of biographical approach. Mm -hmm to tell the history of American conservatism by focusing on six important individuals. Is this because you believe this is a very fruitful, reasonable approach in general, something that historians should use more often? Or is there something special about American conservatism that made you thought that concentrating on those figureheads of the movement might be the best thing to do? I looked at individuals in part because I did think there was a great deal of contingency in the creation of conservatism, by which I mean there were decision points. 
And somebody had to make those decisions as to how to create a movement out of, again, aggregated groups, atomized individuals. And I saw a kind of pattern where a new figure would arise and think, how do I bring more people into this movement? And again, a very willful process. It wasn't just by luck. It wasn't just coincidence. So as I say, anti-communism emerges in the 1950s. A fellow named William Buckley who becomes a great conservative intellectual. He forthrightly thinks that way. How do I bring more people into this movement? Aha, I'm a religious man. I can reach out to other religious people, Catholics in particular, who are anti-communist, in part through the dictum of the Pope, but also out of their concerns about their own religiosity. Decision point, Buckley is critical. In 1964, a man named Barry Goldwater, a senator from Arizona, an economic conservative above all else, thinks again, how do I win enough votes to first achieve the Republican nomination for the presidency and then perhaps win the presidency? He looked toward a group that was not perceived as conservative, essentially white Southerners, who had been traditional Democratic voters, liberal in most ways, and he offered them something they wanted, the right to maintain what they called their way of life, <laughs> which meant segregation against black people, discrimination by law being legal. And Goldwater said, well, you know, we also, we conservatives, believe in a small state. We don't believe in a powerful government. So you should be left alone to do as you wish. And again, a very willful decision. He famously says, it's a funny phrase in, in, in English, I think I better go hunting where the ducks are. And he reaches out to white Southerners and says, you realize that you people are conservative also. You should join our movement, anti-communists, economic decentralists, and now people who believe in states' rights, decentralized government. So suddenly you have a new constituency, and you can keep that process going over time till finally, in 1980, there's a majority for both conservatism and for the takeover of the Republican Party, which then becomes a conservative ideological uh, party apparatus. So finally, let's move a little closer to today. Does Donald Trump stand in the tradition you just described? Does he stand in the tradition of American conservatism? Is he a real, authentic heir to Barry Goldwater or Ronald Reagan? Or does he rather signify the demise or the dissolution of the movement? It depends, doesn't it? So I'm a historian, not uh, a political scientist. I'm not someone who looks at ideology as being a constant or an abstract. So from my perspective, conservatism has evolved over time in an attempt to win voters and gain power. Trump is a new kind of conservative, but he is a conservative. You can find elements of past conservatives in his movement. Certainly he disagrees with things Ronald Reagan said. He disagrees with things William Buckley said. He disagrees with most of the great leaders of conservatism today. But if you look back, the first great conservative was a man named Robert Taft a senator from Ohio. He was an anti-free trader. He was a unilateralist. He didn't believe in NATO. Suddenly you hear Donald Trump use some of the same language that this progenitor of conservatism used in the 1940s and early 50s. So he's a Taftian conservative in part. On the other hand, conservatives have long found, how to put this, um, an enemy. Someone that they can use to explain why certain groups have more power and other groups less. I said African Americans for Barry Goldwater were a kind of enemy. Feminists were an enemy in the 1970s. Gay people have long been an enemy of conservatives. Why? Conservatives believe in social hierarchy. They believe in past traditions. So suddenly Donald Trump, he has a new target. It's not black people. It's not feminists. It's not even particularly gay people. It's immigrants. Another group that helps to explain a power dynamic in the United States. So new target, same theme. New kind of conservative. I don't think he repudiates conservatism. He's in some ways the fulfillment of 21st century conservatism. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us, Mr. Farber. Thank you. Thank you.